Good afternoon, everyone, and welcome to the 12th meeting of the Justice Subcommittee on Policing in 2017. Apologies have been received today from Stuart Stevenson. Our first agenda item today is a decision on whether to take item three in private, which is consideration of our forward work programme. Are we all agreed? Agreed. Thank you very much. Um, we will now move very briefly into private session for a demonstration on body-worn cameras, and we will reconvene in approximately five minutes. So I now move into private.
Agenda item two today is an evidence session on the use of body-worn video cameras by police officers. Um, can I welcome Callum Steele from the Scottish Police Federation, Superintendent Andrew Allen from the Association of Scottish Police Superintendents, Superintendent Nick Topping and Assistant Chief Constable Mark Williams from Police Scotland to the meeting. And can I thank the witnesses for providing written evidence to us and, for, and to Police Scotland for demonstrating demonstrating how the, the body-worn videos are used. Can we move um, straight to questions? Can I refer members to paper one, which is a note by the clerk, and paper two, which is a private paper? Um, and perhaps, can I start by um, asking our witnesses to outline in general terms the, the, the benefits and, and drawbacks of a force-wide use of body-worn um, video cameras? I mean, I, I notice from the... Um, the, the submissions that we've received, that the public are generally supportive, the public feel um, safer, um, and there's also an issue of the, the saving of, of time in, in the court process. In a previous in an inquiry that we've done in, in the Justice Committee, we, we've heard a lot about churn um, and about the costs um, of, of police spending time in, in court. And I note again from the submissions that um, body-worn um, video cameras um, often result in a, a far more um, early guilty plea. So, just in, in general terms, if our witnesses could explain the benefits and, and if there are any drawbacks, um, who would like to who would like to start? Well, perhaps I could yes, set the scene, and yes. I'm sure um, my, my colleagues will, will add more detail to it in due course. Uh, I, I think I think you've very well summarised it yourself in terms of some of the benefits that um, certainly in an Aberdeen context. Uh, have been seen since we've been using body-worn video. Uh, undoubtedly, um, the benefits in relation to the criminal justice process uh, in terms of officer time at court, um, the, the early guilty pleas that you, you referenced there uh, are, a, are, a, are a noteworthy uh, element of the benefits. And of course, um, I think it's important to perhaps stretch them even further and take them out with just the policing context that not only does it potentially offer uh, police officers uh, a greater opportunity to be out and about doing their job in communities as opposed to at court. It also um, very importantly means that less victims are having to go to court to give evidence, which can be a, a traumatic experience. So in terms of the, the victims of crime, there's potential benefits there too. And of course, in the wider piece around the, the taxpayer and the, the money that the criminal justice process takes to run, uh, less court time is good. Uh, and it's a more effective and efficient way of, of operating. So certainly our, the indications from our, our work in Aberdeen are positive in that sense. Uh, there's some other very important positive elements to, to bring out. Uh, officer safety, which you've also reflected on as, as an important part. Um, the, the reduction or the, it's less likely that officers are physically assaulted whilst they're wearing a body-worn video. That's, uh, that appears to be uh, what the evidence suggests from Aberdeen. Um, uh, and equally, there, there's, there's a piece in relation to best evidence and using body-worn video as another layer of evidence to add to the officer's own evidence that they obviously are still absolutely required to present when presenting any case to, to, to the Crown for prosecution. So all of those things um, are, are important. Um, and if we add in the, the, the reduction uh, in relation to uh, substantiated complaints against officers as well, there are certainly a number of noteworthy benefits that, 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 that appear to, to, to play out when we're using body-worn. In terms of disbenefits or, or problems or hurdles, um, Superintendent Topping uh, articulated some of the, 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 the teething issues we've had in relation to just getting the cameras to the, the right spec, the right build quality that we would want. Uh, and that's been a very minor issue, but one that we've had to address. Uh, and I think now, now has been addressed. Uh, and of course, there's then the wider piece, if we were to roll it out nationally, about ICT infrastructure for the organisation, the, the digital um, ability of the justice system as a whole to cope with this sort of evidence uh, and how we move forward uh, in those areas. Because they will take investment, they will take time, they'll take collaboration. Um, and that will have to be considered and, and thought through carefully as part of that process. I think in very general terms, that would be uh, some of the benefits uh, and some of the challenges that we would face moving forward. I, mean, I, I suppose there would need to be quite a, a, 
a substantial in investment if it was to be rolled out um, force wide. But then you would have to balance that against yes. the savings in, in police time and in court time. Um, and, and the benefits to um, recording evidence that you would be absolutely sure was 100 per percent accurate. So it's yeah. a kind of a, a balancing act you have to perform. Yeah. A absolutely. And if this were to happen, there would be not only a full public consultation in relation to this as a, uh, in terms of civil liberties mm. element of it, yeah. which, which of course happened at the local level in Aberdeen uh, and in the North East. But in a wider sense, that would obviously have to, to, to be undertaken. Um, but equally, we would have to look at the cost benefit of doing it yeah. and, and get as much assurance as we possibly could um, that this would pay dividends, uh, not just financially, but in terms of trust and confidence of the public, the criminal justice system and its, uh, its efficiency, the benefit of, of, of the evidence that it provides and its quality. All of that would have to be taken into account because I, I dare say it wouldn't just be pounds, shillings and pence uh, that we would want to measure. We'd want to measure other things too. And that would include public trust and confidence. Okay. Mr Topping, do you want to comment? Yes, I can maybe give some context um, from some of the trials. Um, when it went mainstream across A Division, which is the northeast of Scotland, I did a review over a 13-month period where cases submitted to the Crown Office and Procurator Fiscal where body-worn video form part of the evidence. Um, of that, I could identify that. 91% of the cases resulted in an early guilty plea. Um, the national average is about 40%. Another important aspect is that 51% um, were at first calling. Now, for a police officer, that means that there's less requirement to submit paperwork in relation to full statements. So there's a time saving there. Uh, the national average is 31%. And also as important, 697 officers were not required to attend court uh, to give evidence. Um, which can normally be their full duty. So firstly, from a wellbeing point of view, that means that officers aren't having days cancelled or shifts changed to attend court. And as importantly, that's officers that are left working within the local community. Um, so that was an important aspect. And again, um, 453 civilian witnesses were not required to attend court. Again, that can be a fairly traumatic experience for somebody who's not been through the process before. And for a number of them may have also meant time off work um, I had a, a review of our crime file system because well-being is an important aspect for the officers um, to highlight how many officers um, were being assaulted where, whilst wearing a body-worn video, and it's 5% roughly, um, and compared to the numbers, which that and the antidotal evidence that I'm being told by officers where they have told me that the level of aggression they were facing, they are quite confident would have gone to physical violence if it hadn't been for the presence of the body-worn video. So for them, that, that's an important aspect for me because I first introduced this when I was an area commander um, and it's about putting officers within the community where they can best provide that level of service, which is what the officers want to do. Um, I've not had a police complaint being substantiated where the interaction has been caught on body-worn video. Again, highlights that, unfortunately, a number of complaints made about the police have no foundation. The body-worn video clearly shows that. And again, it brings up a professional aspect because it shows that our interaction with the public are with integrity, fairness and respect. So it's a protection for the public. It's a form of protection for the officers as well. Um, and it's clearly a wellbeing point of view. So for me, they clearly have been a very, very positive piece of equipment for the officers across A Division. We have 330 on a pool basis, enough across the northeast of Scotland for every on-duty officer to have an access to body-worn video. Um, and we try to encourage that purely by highlighting the benefits. Um, you're less likely to be assaulted, you're less likely to have to go to court and give evidence, and you're less likely to be complained about. Um, so it's very important for the officer as a division and for Police Scotland. Okay. Mr Allen, is there anything you would like to add? I've uh, heard the benefits and would agree with those. The infrastructure has been discussed, and I think it's important to see that infrastructure in the context of the, the wide proliferation of devices in public. When you travel home tonight, if you look at the cyclists, look at taxis, look at buses, m many of these already have camera systems in place. The justice system requires to move forward with the technology that the public are using on a day-to-day -day basis. The justice digital strategy is obviously ongoing, as is the development of improved infrastructure between ourselves and the justice partners. Uh, so I think the benefits are substantive and the infrastructure improvements are absolutely necessary. Thank you.
Okay. Callum, is there anything you want to add? I think, in fairness, <coughs> in fairness to those that have gone before, can be, and I would agree with uh, everything that's been said, and I know that that's not something I say often at this forum, that the benefits and advantages of body-worn videos are well understood, I think, not only by uh, police officers, but by the, the wider service. Uh, the, I think the question is not so much whether there's benefits or disbenefits, but the question should be whether there are benefits that we can afford and whether these benefits should be a priority at this particular moment mm. in time. Uh, and I think that's a more fundamental question given the realities of the finances facing the Police Service of Scotland and indeed some of the pressures that uh, are as yet unknown in terms of the capability of other, uh, other organisations within the, the justice sector. When we look at uh, any elements of policing in isolation, it risks giving a false narrative as to the reality of cost benefits. Uh, we don't, for example, as far as I can see, undertake a holistic economic assessment of justice in the way that we do in other areas of, of, of public life, for example, in the health service where we have health economists uh, undertaking huge complex uh, examinations of a variety of particular issues. Uh, and whilst it is undoubtedly true, uh, not least because of the experience that the police officers themselves report, that there have been savings in a variety of different fora, we do not know in absolute reality whether those savings would have been greater if the investment had been put into another area of policing to deliver the same results. The, the benefits for individual officers in terms of uh, their confidence in how they, uh, in how they record information, of course, is, uh, is something that cannot be underplayed in any way, shape or form. Uh, but given an organisation just now that is looking at a £200 million overspend, according to Audit Scotland, uh, over the lifetime of this Parliament, is already facing a huge budget hole uh, this financial year, uh, and uh, whilst I don't want to get into that element of it, mm. um, we do know that... Uh, experience from across the rest of the world is, is that once you start along the body-worn camera path, you're never getting off it. Now, whether that's a good thing or a bad thing, of course, is, a, is an entirely academic discussion. Uh, but the reality is, is that once you start on the path, you are engaging in a series of activities that are going to cost money in both revenue and capital terms uh, on an annual, well certainly at, at least in revenue terms on an annual basis and capital terms on a periodic basis thereafter. Uh, and thus far in the entire conversation and debate and discussions around about body-worn videos, no one is talking about those ongoing revenue costs. Uh, at this time, we, we know that there are a very small number of officers in the northeast of Scotland and a very small part of the justice system is exposed to the evidence issues and I'm not, in terms of, of, of body-worn videos. But if and or when this becomes the norm, the justice system and those involved in it, including defence agents, will adapt to the fact that they're dealing with new technologies and their expectations and demands that will be placed upon their requirements for drawing evidence from these systems mm -hmm. is in its own right going to increase. So I, I, my concern is not one about whether it's desirable but whether it's practical at this point in time uh, to be pursuing it because of the wider realities that face the service. Okay, that's been very helpful. Thank you. Um, just before I, um, I, I move on, I wonder, um, ACC Williams, if, if you um, could give us any information on whether an evaluation is being done on the use of video cameras by the football coordination unit. Um, a specific uh, evaluation of the, 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 mm. the cameras and the, the focus unit as, as it's known. Um, the, the benefits that we would uh, perceive from those cameras um, are, are similar to the ones that we would perceive to be the case in Aberdeen. Uh, of course, they're used in a, in a more um, in a narrower field of mm -hmm. use. It is predominantly for policing football. Um, and as you've already uh, articulated, there's only a small number of them, about 50 cameras, 14 or 50 cameras in total. Um, so we do think they have a use uh, and they are further, a further way of gathering evidence um, of crowd behaviour and so on uh, at football matches uh, and presenting that by way of evidence to, to the Crown. Um, but we haven't undertaken the level of evaluation that has been undertaken both by uh, A Division itself and by uh, independent evaluators of the work in the North East. Um, of course, if we were to, to, to move forward with a, a wider rollout of body-worn video, we would have to very carefully consider all of the areas in which we would potentially use it. Obviously, in the North East, that's predominantly community and response policing, frontline police officers. But of course, there's other elements to policing where body-worn video, in a specialist sense, 
has a very um, particular or very very purposeful use. For example, our armed officers. Um, there are recommendations at the national level that, uh, as soon as is reasonably practical, uh, armed police, police officers should be equipped with body-worn video. Uh, that will more typically be done on a helmet camera mm -hmm. um, because of the sensitivities of the environment in which they work uh, and the need to protect both them and, and the public. So there, there's a bigger piece in, in terms of all of the evaluation, all of the work that would have to be done prior to rolling out body-worn video. Um, and I think that's something that undoubtedly would be, would be picked up and done as, as, as a mm. process of scoping moved into the process of consultation, business case development, benefits, disbenefits, and, and ultimately uh, a full business case if it gets to that stage. Um, I would like to perhaps, if I may, just, just contextualise body worn in the wider sort of context around 2026, mobility, technology. Mm. Some, some of the themes I think Callum rightly w w was picking up on there because it is important just to place body worn in, in that field and, and, and perhaps highlight where it sits. Um, next week, the, the, the 2026 10 year policing strategy will, will go to the Scottish Police Authority Board on the 22nd. Um, if it's signed off there, we will then move to a, a three year implementation plan for some of the, the developments that we foresee taking place over the next few years. And at the heart of that is trying to achieve an, op uh, an organisation which is sustainable operationally and financially. Uh, we we recognise the challenges that we face. Uh, financially and the, the planning around that is very much to try and deliver something that is sustainable. Within that there is specific reference to technology. In the, in the consultation there's reference to body-worn video mm. but indeed body-worn video is a, is a small part of potentially the sort mm. of technology we can bring to frontline officers and yes of course there will be costs associated with that um, and, and, and Callum's um, point about being on the path of then having to, to sustain that going forward is absolutely accurate and that would have to be considered uh, and have to be uh, costed over, over the next three years and beyond uh, as, as we make best use of the finances we have and ensure that we do have a, uh, an organisation that is financially s sustainable. Um, we, we foresee technology as being a key enabler to creating capacity for police officers, to better serving the justice system, to providing a better service to, to the public um, and whilst, of course, there will be costs associated with that, any business case and any consultation will have to consider them and have to prove that there is a benefit to it mm. wherever possible. Um, and I think as we move forward with, with mobility, mobile devices that officers can use to access data and information that allows them to remain away from a police station and uh, out and about in, in our communities. And, and when we look at the, the sort of technology that is available through body-worn, laptops, tablets, mobile devices, mm. uh, telemetrics and other such, such technology. We really need to start investing in our own infrastructure to take advantage of that because the advantages that the officers get can be di directly translated to the service delivery for the public. Mm. Um, and, and we need to keep up with that. Yeah. We, we can't afford uh, financially or in terms of our service delivery to stand still. So Callum is right, that needs to be carefully considered uh, and that's something we very much will do uh, and it is very much touched upon in the 2026 planning and the work that will go on over the next three years. Okay. Um, I have a, a couple of supplementaries, but I, I just wanted to ask you, in context of, of using the body-worn cameras, specifically in, in the, the sphere of football, if it's on a one-to-one, -one, um, you can explain to the, the, or the officer can explain to the person that has been stopped that they have a camera they are about to start recording. If body-worn video cameras were to be used in the context of a football match, specifically for, for crowd control or for viewing a crowd, you would have a serious issue about um, explaining to any number of people that you were going to be recording them. And the issue of, of, of data retention um, certainly comes into mind. And I know other, um, other members will raise that, so I'm going to kind of throw that out there. And when data is raised, you can maybe come back. All, all, all our data is, is retained and managed and dealt with under legislation. Mm -hmm. So any data that is not used as evidence is deleted and destroyed within, within, within okay. the, the, the fixed period of time. Um, in, in terms of CCTV, in a wider mm -hmm. sense, which is what body-worn video yeah. is, um, of course, at football matches, there is CCTV running yeah. throughout the stands. Uh, Body-worn video is no different to that, but if it becomes an issue with an individual mm -hmm. uh, or is to be used as evidence, then that explanation must, 
not legislatively, it doesn't have to be made, but as Nick uh, highlighted mm -hmm. earlier, uh, it's good practice to articulate that whatever the individual, for example, is, is saying in, convert, in, in conversation with a police officer is being video recorded. So when you're at a football match or, or walking down the high street in the capital or elsewhere, you are on CCTV and there's not a specific individual warning to every person. It is, it is covered by signage and, and by, other, by other warnings of that nature uh, on the entry and exit to, to for example, a sporting stadium. Okay. Um, I've got a couple of supplementaries, um, Ben first and then John, and if you could move on to your substantive point after that, Ben. Thank you, Convener. So, around the, the, the same theme, uh, uh, to, to Mary Fee's question, what capacity and potential do you think there is here for the use of the, the devices within slow time inquiries? And uh, further to that, what uh, has there been any evidence of the, the, the deterrent factor in terms of uh, the, uh, the occurrence of crime uh, when, the, these, uh, when there's been an awareness in communities that these devices have been deployed? I can, I can give you one actually specific example about a protracted inquiry. Um, there, was a, there was a robbery at a news agent's um, in Aberdeen um, where the assailant had his face covered but was wearing distinctive clothing. And as part of the wider inquiry, um, there was a harvest of CCTV um, from um, the public space CCTV and the body-worn video. Um, and the body-worn video actually captured that individual involved in something completely different, quite distinctive clothing, but the face unmarked, and that led to a detection, uh, and somebody was reported for a, a robbery at a news agent's, um, which was important. Um, so that was the, uh, your second point, sir, was, sorry? Uh, sorry, uh, uh, around the, the potential uh, and capacity for the devices to provide a deterrence effect within communities if there's an awareness that those uh, devices are being deployed. As part of the deployed. first survey uh, and review I did um, of the pilot in 2011, um, we targeted it in specific areas and we drew some stats from that three-month period and the previous year's three-month period. Now, we had to be very, very careful because it was 39 cameras only over a three-month period, but it did show a reduction in antisocial behaviour and violent crime. It's like anything, if, if, if people know that there's going to be clear CCTV within an area, that itself acts as a deterrent. And it comes back to probably the assaults on police officers they are clear deterrents because they know that it will be captured in relation to their interactions. So there, there has been some small antidotal evidence that there has been reduction in crime. Um, crime continues to fall, as we, as we know, um, so there's not been a wider scale specific drill down um, in relation to wider use because it's at officer's discretion across the northeast of Scotland. So it would be quite a difficult survey to carry out, but that's small three-month period specifically within some communities within Aberdeen and Aberdeen city centre itself highlighted a reduction in crime. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah, I'll, I'll just roll them together, yeah. uh, convener. Um, it's, it's a question for Mr Steele about your submission, um, both in your written evidence and <clears throat> Um, earlier, Mr Steele, you, you did recognise the, the benefits that are associated with this, but um, to my mind this would be a substantive change in the workplace and, and in, in your evidence you talk about the SPF is not cited in the work or aware of any issues under consideration with regard to 2026. That's very alarming. Can you expand on that, please? Yeah, I think it's important to uh, put this in, uh, in complete context. When the Grampian project was uh, undertaken, both in terms of pilot and, this, and the wider substantive rollout, the then Grampian Joint Branch Board of the Scottish <coughs> Police Federation was heavily involved in the consultation uh, for that and uh, uh, through, uh, through its offices uh, offered support and raised a number of di uh, different issues which uh, the then Grampian Police uh, gave consideration to. Uh, in responding to the request for evidence, the letter from the clerk from this committee made clear that this was in response to scoping work that the Police Service of Scotland was undertaking in respect of body-worn body -worn cameras as part of the 2026 strategy. What I said in, the, I think, one of the first sentences of the response was, we're not aware of what that scoping work is. Uh, we know that it's mentioned within the 2026 strategy as one of the, uh, one of the many elements of it. But beyond that, we've had no uh, communications with the service about that particular issue. Well, you'll know why I used the I, phrase okay. substantive change yeah. in the workplace. This yeah. is a legislative requirement, Mr Williams. Can you comment on that, please? You're, you're obliged to consult with the workforce on any substantive change in the workplace. Uh, absolutely, and I can give an absolute commitment that should 
we move to even consider an introduction of body-worn video, um, that would absolutely be done. Um, I think that, just going back to the point Calm and yourself both, both raised, at the moment, this sits uh, as, as a small part of a far bigger piece of work, which is the 2026 uh, work that's ongoing, and the Scottish Police Federation, ASPs, and other stakeholders have been widely consulted in relation to all that is within that draft 10-year policing strategy or plan. Um, that, that certainly, I, 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 I hope I, I speak um, um, accurately, the, the case. Um, what I was discussing earlier is very important, again, to contextualise. The 10-year strategy is a 10-year strategy. Within that, there's going to be a three-year implementation plan, which will actually be what are we going to do specifically over the next three years to deliver and move us in the direction of the 10-year the plan. That will be consulted on over the summer assuming it is approved and signed off by the Scottish Police Authority on the 22nd of this month. Uh, within that, there but will be I, a... I, I wonder, can I stop you there? Yes. Because, I mean, obviously, it's better to have the earliest possible participation Ab and buy-in is, the, is the, the phrase that's often used nowadays. If something's going to be signed off next week, should, should there not have been engagement in respect of that with the staff associations and trade unions? Th that has happened. That, that engagement has taken place uh, and has been ongoing for a number of months. Well, um, I see... I see Mr Steele smiling, and I, I don't know if that's wind or he's, he takes a contrary <laughs> view. Um, is that the case then, Mr uh, Steele? The Scottish Police Federation, like every member of the public, was invited to comment on the wider 2026 strategy. On that, the SPF provided a submission. On the specific issue of body-worn cameras, that has not featured. Other, I, other than I, a general mention within I, the strategy. I, I think the definition... Might, might be angels dancing in the head of a pin, but we haven't had discussion in BBCs. I think the definition of scoping perhaps is, is perhaps more, 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 the, more, the key, more the issue here then, because uh, at this stage um, we have no dedicated staff doing anything in relation to body-worn video other than that that exists in the northeast of Scotland. Uh, what we do have and what we are building is a team that will work through the next three years to, to introduce mobility in the wider sense before we even get to thinking about bits of camera equipment that will be on the front of police officers, we need to get our ICT infrastructure, our core operating policing systems in, in, in hand and in, and in place. Uh, that is a substantial piece of work that will require substantial investment. That investment is being planned and will start this year. Um, once that has developed, we will be in a place to consider what equipment, like body-worn video, we might be able to make best use of in the future to, uh, with, a, with an infrastructure that will, will sustain it and support it. That is not the case at the moment, other than the very localised area of the northeast of yeah. Scotland. So we are not nearly at the point of considering purchasing body-worn video en masse. Um, we are in the position now where we are preparing the organisation for the next 10 years, for the next three years, and importantly, right now, to get our ICT infrastructure up and running in a more solid place, in a reliable place, in a place that will allow us to take advantage of technology in the future. And that will be the point at which we start a consultation, both internally and externally, with what that might look like in terms of the actual hardware. OK, thank you. That's very reassuring. I don't think we need to rake over the calls of I-6, but clearly there's no point in having another dimension to policing if there isn't the support back at, uh, at base. Can, can I ask that the cynic in me goes that um, any automation can be seen as an opportunity by any cynical managers that may about or, or accountants. So would it be better to deploy two police officers without body-worn camera or one with? We are in a position where we need to have a sustainable financial and operational uh, police service. That is very much what we are trying to do. Body-worn video is not an alternative to police officers. It is an asset that police officers use. Uh, it's about obviously protecting both them and the public and ensuring we have the best evidence with which to which to, which to pursue criminals. Um, so um, the, the cost benefits would be something we would take account of and obviously have to articulate very clearly. Um, but I think police officers require technology moving forward to do their job as effectively as possible. Body-worn is one potential element of that, not the only one. Um, and first and foremost, we need to give them, uh, as you've pointed out already, um, solid day in, day out, computing and infrastructure that allows them to do their job. We then look to the future in terms of what we can build onto that and how we can improve that further by way of any digital 
strategy, not just with the police service, but, but with the criminal justice partners as well. Okay, two very quick questions, if I may, convener. Um, officer safety will be paramount, mm -hmm. regardless of whether this uh, kit's provided or not? Mr. Of Lundy. course, officer safety yeah. is paramount, okay. yes. And, and, a, and a final point, there was much has been made of the, the reduced level of complaints against officers, yes. and where complaints had been made, where officers were born wearing body-worn camera, um, that they were able to be rebutted, the complaints yes. were made. That's has correct. there been a consequential increase in the number of prosecutions for false accusation of crimes against police officers? Because that would certainly be another way of deterring. Yes. There hasn't been. What's happened is that because it's been a localised in North East of Scotland, there hasn't been the stats pulled from the Professional Standards Division in relation to um, what's happened. But my, my own understanding is that we, the organisation hasn't taken anybody forward for a false accusation or wasting police time. Uh, the reason being the ones I have seen, they have thought they have had cause to complain through the investigation of the incident and the body one video, it has shown that that complaint has had no substance for it. So there hasn't been at the moment, Mr Finney, but it may be something that would be looked at as the future as we go through. Interestingly, um, I'm aware from, from forces elsewhere in the UK that there are some, there are some interesting statistics that, that, that present themselves when body worn is used. Um, and you know, Callum may, may have, a, have a view on this, but actually what has often been seen is that there are a, a higher number of, of charges levelled of police assault and so on because there is evidence and officers trust the evidence that they can use to support the, the, the charge that is being made. Uh, whereas sometimes, and I don't support this, but sometimes um, officers don't pursue a, a charge against a, an accused who has been abusive or potentially physically violent because they, they don't feel they, ha they will have the support or the evidence to actually see that, 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 that through. The body-worn video actually offers something more in that sense and um, it, may not, it may not present as a reduction in, in police assaults, mm -hmm. it may actually allow for us to better evidence those that do take place and that actually might, might throw the figures in the other direction, that's been seen elsewhere. Um, that's not something to be scared of, though. That's something okay. to welcome. Okay. okay, many thanks indeed. Rona, <clears throat> was your supplementary very, very no, brief? No. All oh, right, because you... Well, okay. Just, just before I bring um, Margaret, and just for, for clarity, um, were the Superintendents Association consulted on the rollout or the use of, of video cameras? As Mr Williams has described in agreement with Callum, the, the 2026 programme has been well consulted on. Uh, the superintendents are well cited on the, the work that's been discussed here. Nick and I have spoken about this work over the last couple of months. So we've probably been able to take advantage of our involvement in this process to be further ahead of the game. But I'm absolutely comfortable with the consultation process that Mr Williams describes. Okay, thank you. Margaret? Was that a no, uh, Mr Mr. Allen, there hasn't been a formal <coughs> consultation. There's been formal consultation on the stages that are already in place, and there has been informal and wider consultation because we are better sighted on some of the development of this work. Okay. <coughs> Mr. Williams, um, obviously this is going to come at a considerable cost. What are your competing priorities? Well, of course, as I, I stated already, having a, a sustainable f operational and financial policing service is absolutely crucial. Um, there, there's a great many priorities in policing, and one of the things that we, we do know looking to the future is that demand is changing. Um, we know that the increase in, in demand around, for example, cyber, uh, historical reporting of, of sexual crime, um, sexual crime itself, um, the competing demands that are placed on by the public for, for policing events and, and national security and, uh, as well, all have to, have to be addressed and all have to be managed uh, into the future. Um, what we hope mobility and body-worn video as a part of that offers is a chance to create more capacity for the police service. Um, and whilst there are competing priorities uh, and competing priorities financially, it is hoped that actually the cost-benefit of something like body-worn video or mobility actually supports our, um, our ability to manage that changing demand and to serve the needs of, of the public. The reason I ask that, because um, the evidence seems very skewed from you. I mean, no doubt that you're 100 per cent pretty well in favour of this, but I'm less uh, sure about 
where you, you see the other priorities and the adequate cognizance have been taken of that. And probably that view has been confirmed by the very minor issues that you've raised and um, in contrast to a recent freedom of information request where uh, there were 300 issues logged by police officers. Yes. Could you give me a kind of uh, assessment of that? Very happy to, and I'll bring, I'll bring in Nick, who, who was party to that. Um, um, I think in, in context, the, the, the cameras are ultimately a very reliable piece of equipment, and that's my, my, the one thing I want to stress, and that has been borne out across numerous police, police organisations across not just the UK. The number of faults that were reported um, were, were, were minor and are in context of hundreds of thousands of deployments of the camera, a tiny number. So I'll let Nick just speak more, more in a more detailed sense around that, but I have no personal concern around the reliability of the camera itself uh, or the reliability that we have seen in Aberdeen. It has had to be refreshed and updated and we've had to buy new batteries and so on. That's natural in the life cycle of the product. Uh, that would, of course, have to be costed in the future, but there's no concern specifically about the, the, the technology being unreliable per se. Just on that, if I can, there was actually 288 faults because some of them were duplicate reports, uh, and we do encourage officers to, to submit a report if there's an issue. Um, we don't keep a record of how many times the body-worn video cameras are deployed, but even on a 50% a deployment of the 330 cameras we have, that's over 180,000 a year. Um, the 288 faults were over a 36-month period, so it's, it's very, very insignificant. The computers and the desktops that are assigned to run 24-7 um, right through the year, so sometimes the software had to be rebooted, and there were some minor issues with the clip, but they were a trial clip. As the ACC has highlighted, um, we've had these cameras now for four or five years, and there's some um, issues with a battery holding a charge, and that's where the refresh program's coming through, and all the cameras are being replaced. So this very, very small number of faults far outweigh the wider benefits we've seen. Um, but as has been highlighted, um, the cameras are now that we have are getting outdated and they're, they're being refreshed. Isn't that a problem in itself? Technology moves on so regularly, these plans. I mean, we had a demonstration for five minutes and already we were looking at a new model to replace the, the one yeah. that had been there. Difficulties switching on and off, the battery life being looked at, but perhaps only 20 minutes recording. Um, the difficulty of um, ensuring that you're protecting someone who doesn't want to be recorded, you record an incident, an incident. if someone is in that footage that doesn't want to be uh, recorded, is there a problem by using that footage? footage? And um, yeah, just, I think you explained that they could be worn if, um, if a police officer was properly, well, I think, was it a vest, uh, a protection vest they had on? But if they're dressed as you are, just on Mr. Topping, they couldn't be. And in terms of academic research, um, this apparently was contradictory. Yes, certainly there, there seemed to be evidence of reduction in assaults, but there was also a concern that they gave officers a false sense of security and perhaps encouraged risk taking. Also, the aspect I'd like to ask about is um, in the recording of evidence. If we don't have footage, and I think we're referring to probably what Mr. Steele said, once you've got these, then they really have to, to keep going, using them, replacing them. And does that then downgrade the kind of evidence that we are normally taking in courts just now? Just coming back on some of the points, um, the 20 minute battery life has only been over the last couple of months because the cameras are four years old, so that's part of the refresh. And part of the wider scoping and the specific issues of body worn video would encapsulate whereas we'll have a warranty cost, where there would be a natural refresh, because obviously technology vastly improves um, as we progress through time. Um, in relation to the wearing of it, for instance, with myself, I wouldn't deploy operationally like this um, because of not having officer safety equipment. It's a requirement to have it, so I therefore would be able to carry the body worn video um, if I was out and about um, on my vest. Um, in relation to some people not wanting to be recorded, um, officers are normally invited into a house because somebody has wanted to report a crime or 
under a legal requirement because there's an ongoing disturbance. Um, we have usually found that people who don't want to be recorded are the people that we're specifically looking at because they're committing a crime. So again, in fairness to all, it captures that interaction. So not only does it protect the officer, it actually protects a member of the public. Or what we've found, there's been a lot of academic um, evidence. Domestic abuse is a very good example where if we're called to house, one member may be a victim, one member may be the assailant. The assailant may not want it recorded, but it's clearly of a benefit for the victim and for the wider criminal justice. All this has to be taken in context, and the final result would be what is legally submissible, and that is where the challenge would come, because we just present the evidence to the court, and it would be for the court to decide what they actually want to take as evidence. And if a member of the public or a victim of crime has an issue about that body one video footage being used, that would come through the defence or the procurator fiscal. Because we don't store any footage um, beyond 28 days if it's not going to be used for court purposes, because under ECHR we have to justify why we hold the footage. So if it's not of evidential value, we don't keep the footage. It automatically deletes after 28 days, unless we think there may be a, a police complaint where we would retain it slightly longer but we do not routinely hold the footage at all unless it's for uh, evidential purposes. And so that would be competing with um, maybe police notes? Yeah, that, this is, the body one video is to supplement evidence. It doesn't replace the use of notebooks. Mm -hmm. It doesn't replace corroboration, although corroboration comes from any forms. And it doesn't replace the police officer's account of actually what's happened. It's just further evidence um, to show and another example would be the body-worn video might not capture fully and focus what has happened, um, but it will pick up the sound. So you have that facility where it, it might actually only be able to record verbally because if I am dealing with a member of the public um, and there's an ongoing disturbance or there's a wider disturbance, we won't capture it all, but it's just additional evidence to what is then given as a legal account by the officers through verbally and as part of the police statements. Any other comments on that long list of things that were read? No, no only perhaps add, and it's, it's in the written evidence we submitted, that there are seven guiding principles for the use of body-worn video, that, uh, and, and principle four is that the operational use of it must be proportionate, legitimate, and necessary, and that ACHR, you know, obviously uh, is the lens through which that is, that is assessed, and, and officers are responsible in terms of their judgment and their use of it for, for that. Uh, as they are day in, day out for, for lots of decisions th uh, that they take. So those seven guiding principles which are laid out there uh, are very specific and we do comply with them all and obviously we'd continue to do so. Can I just ask one further question? That's um, the partners that may be using this footage, do they have the necessary equipment to be able to utilise the footage from the, the body one cameras? Uh, one of the key elements looking to the future is, is that we want to, uh, as Andrew ha ha has touched on, uh, be in a position where our partners and us can uh, transfer digital evidence and digital information to each other. We're not in that position as we speak. There is a, a, a government strategy to make digital the justice system, uh, and of course the Crown Office uh, wants to do likewise. We are working with the Crown and the government and other partners like uh, the Scottish Prison Service to do that. But that is a journey that we're now on and it will take collaboration and work. What we do at present, and again, Nick can, can speak in detail about that, is the, the images from the body-worn videos are, are burnt onto DVDs and are delivered to the Crown Office for use as you would CCTV evidence from, from any public space environment. So that is, um, that is what happens in a number of forces elsewhere. Equally, there are some forces where they have a digital relationship with the, the prosecuting authority. That's where we want to get to. Uh, that will take some time and investment, uh, but it offers benefits for the whole justice system, not just for ourselves. Okay, thank you. Can I just ask what training is given to officers to, to make sure that the, the use of the, the body bone video is proportionate and reasonable and does not breach human rights? We have a, a guidance document that we give out. We have champions within each of the stations who will then go through uh, the practical aspects of using it. Um, there's a PowerPoint that really is a very, very simplistic guide about how to use it. Um, we have a legislative handout in case somebody has an objection, so the officer is well aware of 
what the justification is for using that. Um, the actual use of the body with camera as a, as a system is very, very straightforward, but it's important that officers are trained and they have that guidance to refer to. And we've also, as you would expect, videoed how to use it, and then we've posted that video, and that was making use of the body one video, so they're very well trained in the actual use. And we have, had, we have never had an issue of any problem with an officer using it, downloading it, or presenting it to the Crown Office as a production. Okay. Ben, did you have a supplementary before I bring Liam in? Yes, uh, thank you. It touches on that, that point, downloaded. Um, it's a, a, just, just for clarity and on a practical and technical basis, do the devices record to themselves and then have to be downloaded uh, on a desktop or uploaded to a server? Or are the images transferred directly to, to a server, to an operation station? What happens is that um, they're downloaded on the hard drive within a camera, which is encrypted. They are then downloaded to a standalone um, RAD system that sits within each police office next to a docking station. And again, that's all encrypted. Um, and then what happens is they're burned onto disk and produced as a production, as we would for any other CCTV evidence. Because one of the things that's very, very important is there has to be a very secure signature throughout. Um, because the whole integrity of body-worn video evidence could be challenged if something was to be interfered with or was to appear somewhere out with the realms of the, the justice process. We have never had that issue because that was looked at right at the very, very start. They're very robust. They've been ongoing now, including the pilot, for almost seven years, and there's never been any issues. Um, some devices go onto a SIM card I didn't think that was secure enough. That's why it goes onto a hard drive. Um, there's specific software you must have um, to be able to download it. So, for instance, if an officer was to lose one of these or it was to be pulled from them, and if there was any footage that was on it, you, you would not be able to download it unless you had the specific software, which we have. Uh, and that's only sold directly by the company mm -hmm. to the police as part of the licence for and, it. And given that if, if, if a device was taken from, a, from an officer, that evidence would therefore be, be lost potentially. It, would there be an ambition going forward to develop the technology so that it was actually a, a live feed almost to a, an operation centre? That, that technology does exist with the cameras, but again, it comes back to the ACC's point is about the scoping and what we want and what is best for. But it's like any form of technology. I mean, it's the same as your mobile phone that you have. They do have um, Wi-Fi technology and that will all be looked at, but the devices do have that facility at the moment. Thank you. Liam. Just following up on that point, it, it, there were some concerns expressed in some of the evidence we saw around um, earlier iterations of this being exceptionally data heavy and the capacity within the system to hold that uh, was struggling. Has, has that, over the, the, the years perhaps of the Aberdeen, of the North East pilot, um, been addressed to an extent? Is it the, the burning onto DVDs, for example, does that ease some of the, the capacity yeah, issues? Yeah, there's never actually been a capacity issue because, because, as I mentioned before, we actually have to justify more why we retain it. So it's only for evidence, but once it's burned to disk and then submitted to the fiscal, it's part of the criminal process, so we don't have to hold that. Um, if it's not of evidential value, it's deleted after 28 days. So each standalone hard drive is a terabyte. We have never got anywhere near that capacity. Um, so there never has been that issue of the, the volume of data storage that we have. Um, sometimes it's more, people get a bit, um, they misunderstand about the data storage or the data requirement to deal with the footage initially. Um, so that there, there's never been an issue with that at all. I, I, I'm, I'm reassured by what you were saying in terms of the 28-day um, retention policy, because I think when we took evidence um, uh, previously on, on uh, matters relating to, to, to RIPA, uh, I think there was some anxiety within the committee about a, a, a six-year period, in a sense, that was the length of time that was allowed, and, and, and it just ran its course, as opposed to uh, uh, decisions maybe being taken earlier to, to, um, uh, to, to delete and destroy that, uh, that, that evidence. But for that 28-day deadline, um, is it uh, other occasions where it's ex extended and what's the process for extending yeah, we, that? Is we that can extend process? it. If, as an example, if an officer has an interaction and um, an officer, a member of the public says, I'm going to make a complaint, he can come back and he, he can ask his supervisor, because it's only with admin rights, to, to select that footage and then to retain it for longer. Um, 
what happens is I have an admin right to all the systems. I can go in and look at footage that's been retained, so we can retain it longer, so that if a complaint comes in, a professional standards department can then pull that footage and review it, because sometimes the complaint can take a number of months before it comes in, so it would fall out with the 28 days, and that's about being open. Because a point as well in relation to the earlier question about security, officers don't have access to view any footage that's downloaded. They can only view their own footage, and it's part of the security signature that goes throughout. As an admin user, I can view the footage and I can look at what is there and why it's been retained, and we do ask intrusive questions. Okay. A couple of other um, brief questions, if I can. Uh, the issue of cost has come up um, uh, quite a bit over the course of, of this afternoon's session. I, I notice in um, the submission uh, put in by you yourselves, Mr Allen, that um, it, it, it talks about considerations. Um, I mean, its conclusion is that I mean, we need be cautious about the overall ongoing costs associated with the general rollout. And then more specifically, it talks about data storage, uh, quoting um, figures from a New York Times article from January 2017, estimating the ongoing costs of equipment maintenance and data storage <coughs> in the region of um, 20 to 40 US dollars per officer per month, depending on the number of um, recordings made. I, I, I don't know whether you can sketch that out any uh, any further, and, and, and whether there's been work done at this stage to try and quantify the overall costs. Mo I, I suspect there are because there'll be various options that might be pursued. There won't be a single figure. But uh, uh, are you able to give us some indication of the, the sorts of order of magnitude the costs that different options um, are likely to, to bring with them? I think we would need to look at that in two parallel streams, both of which have been described already. As Mr Williams says, we're at the very, very early stages, so the actual selection of what product we were going to use, how we were going to use it, would be one component. And separately, we are working with uh, the, the Justice Strategy Team on the management of digital evidence between the Justice Partners. That's just uh, at what's being referred to as the alpha stage, to look at the movement of digital evidence initially looking at CCTV because of its, its prevalence between ourselves and Crown. So as work on that stream progresses, we will understand what economies of scale are available on that. And regardless of body-worn video, that will have to contend with the wider use of public uh, gathering of, of video. It will have to look at the evidence procedure work about increased videoing of victim and child witness evidence. So regardless of what we as a service do, the volume of digital evidence is increasing significantly and we have to understand and manage that and that should deliver economies of scale to the benefit of the product and usage selection that is the parallel work stream. But in simplest answer, there is no precise number at the moment that I could give with any confidence. Mm -hmm. I think, as, as Andrew has articulated, uh, some of these early, as you said, alpha tests are called. I, I, I'm no expert on the sort of project management terminology, but that, that, that is what it is known as, which will move information between ourselves and the Crown digitally. will start to allow us to cost what that looks like and then consider how that might expand, obviously, in a wider in a wider setting. Um, I've, I've spoken at length with um, our director of ICT. He sits on the the digital direction group, as it's known, with government, with, with the court service and with the Crown and others, uh, and they are overseeing that, that work. And uh, in truth, in a policing, policing context, um, whilst obviously there is a cost with the storage of, of data, cloud-based or, or otherwise, um, the, the, the more significant cost that we will have to um, assess uh, and make, uh, make a business case for is actually how you, you manage the information and manage the data, the, the, the evidence itself, how it is stored, administered, clipped, kept, how we provide it for frontline officers, how it forms part of the bigger prize, which is giving officers information on the street when they're out working. Uh, that's crime intelligence information, vehicle checks and information, and other such things, stop and search database and so on. That, that will sit at the heart of any police information system. That, that is what is required to enable a lot of the other technology and actually requires far, far closer scrutiny at this stage around cost mm -hmm. to enable things like body worn to work. Okay. Um, and that is, that is, again, the very early stages now of development. And what comes first is the infrastructure within Scotland being made uh, sufficiently reliable uh, and sustainable 
to sit things like this on top of it. Um, I, I'm, I'm no ICT expert, but you know the, 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 that is the case at this stage, and that work is now is now starting. Okay. So we're in the early stages. Okay, thank you. Just finally, um, come here for me. You talked earlier, um, Mr. Williams, about the, the seven principles of, of usage. Um, I, I note again from the ASP sub submission. Um, a, a reference to um, uh, concerns expressed by the Police Executive Research Forum, albeit back in 2015, but uh, presumably at a time where the principles were, were in existence, where it cautioned that um, uh, body-worn uh, uh, video raised enormous questions about what is recorded, when to record, how to protect victims who don't want to be recorded, uh, how you know what impact it will have on your relationship with the community, uh, and, and uh, questioned how the police will define the circumstances of when to turn the camera on and turn it yes. off. Um, I mean, we've touched on some of that, yeah. but, but these were clearly concerns being expressed at a time where these principles existed, yes. um, and, and we were seeing um, the rollout in the North East, but, but also earlier rollouts um, in, in other parts of the UK. Uh, how would you respond to the, to the, the, the quite serious anxieties being expressed by, yeah. uh, by Perth? Yeah. I think it would be very important to, first of all, stress that before there was any rollout, if it were to happen, that the public and the public consultation uh, and ensuring that the public fully understood what we were proposing was at the heart of any development that we were undertaking. And that would absolutely be the case, and I would make that commitment uh, here today. So we would be very, very careful to ensure the public were fully engaged in what was proposed, what it would mean, how it would work in practice. And of course, we have learned a great deal from from Aberdeen in terms from of that from that North yes. that Aberdeen yeah. experience. Was the was the sort of prior consultation of the kind that you were talking about with the, the, the public and stakeholders? Yes, it was. I'll let Nick articulate yeah. that. We did a, we did a, an internal and an external consultation programme of work because it was important that. Uh, members of the public knew that officers were going to be out and about wearing body worn video, uh, and that was done through a number of outlets and the media assisted greatly in that. And then what we did uh, within the three months is we ran a consultation, but we used a citizens panel so it was independent um, through Aberdeen City Voice. And they went through a questionnaire through a thousand householders, and we also separately um, sent out a questionnaire to all locally elected um, key individuals and key networks within the Aberdeen area because it was important we had the feedback and um, a vast majority supported, 76% supported it, 0.1% didn't, the rest were neutral in their views, 53% um, said it would make the community safer, less than 1% said it, it wouldn't, um, the rest were neutral in their views, so there was that public consultation. Uh, even, even where there was support, I mean, it, was any of the support caveated and, and, and in which case were there elements of the way in which you structured the, the, the pilot and the rollout uh, to reflect that or, or in a sense was it, was it really a ringing endorsement of what you were proposing to do anyway? It, it was an endorsement of what we were looking to do and I think because of the way the majority of the members of the public now know that almost every single person carries a camera within their pocket as part of their mobile phone so they live now in that digital culture and they didn't have anything that raised any concerns with them um, but, but it was important they knew it was coming and it was quite positive and through the interaction of the officers with the members of the public wearing the body worn video it's been positive some people don't like it um, but to be honest that's usually individuals that we're targeting in relation to the course of our duties so, so it has been very very positive both from the public from the media and just as important from the officers themselves I, I, and I, I, so just lastly, on the, in terms of the feedback from those you say you're, you're targeting, who, uh, targeting who perhaps um, have been um, less effusive in their, in their endorsement of it, I, amongst the, their legal representatives and amongst um, defence lawyers, has, has there been um, any concerns raised? No, there's never, there's never been a challenge and we, we have given some inputs, myself personally, to a number of defence uh, advocates and within various legal forums, but there's never been a challenge in relation to body-worn video evidence, um, either prior or as court, but again, that's part of the disclosure because they have access before it comes to trial, and I think that is part of the reason there are so many early guilty pleas. And just a sort of wider point on the ethical point of view, as part of the Metropolitan Police rollout, um, in 2016, there was a panel that was done through the local policing ethics panel that was chaired by Lord uh, Carlyle, I believe it was, with a number of independents who were there. Um, and they reviewed a number of aspects of the wider rollout of body-worn video. Um, and what they actually came back was that 
this device would actually, they thought, improve that public interaction and trust. So it's been washed through an ethical panel down in London with independents um, who have come back positively for it. But again, it's very, very important that it's through the EIA and PIA that there is that much wider consultation with a number of partners and the community so that they know potentially what was coming and what the feedback is before there's any further forward. Rona. Just very briefly to follow up on, on Liam's point, um, on the ECHR side, um, is that covered by asking the question, asking for permission? And if for whatever reason the officer didn't ask for permission, would that, could that individual then say it was a breach of their human rights? No. And what, what if that individual, in another scenario, disputed the fact that they'd given you their permission? What would happen then? The CCTV is overt, so they don't have to have that permission, especially within it's in a public environment. And if they walk into a domestic premises, as I said, usually it's because they've been invited by one party or there's an ongoing crime. So there's a legal basis to use that. If somebody has an objection, and that's where the body on video is of benefit, that objection will actually be recorded. So right up front, we're aware that that individual has objected to it being captured. And that's when it comes down to the legal process, because if it goes to court, the defence will stand up and say, I or my client have an objection for that being used within a court of law, because that's where this comes. If it's not for a court of law, the footage is deleted, so it goes no further forward. Um, and again, that's where the body one video is important, because <coughs> it's actually captured somebody saying, I object to you using that or me being captured on body one video, and it's there right at the start. Okay, that's fine, thank you. Do you have a very brief supplementary, John? Uh, very, very brief supplementary. Very, very, very brief. Convener, thanks. And it is about, uh, all the members have talked about uh, the prevalence of members of the public carrying about bits of equipment. Have any members of the public said, well, I'll film you, and, and what would the response be if that were the request? We, we are filmed uh, routinely, um, day in, day out. Um, the police service is one of the few services that isn't filming other people. Um, we are filmed uh, regularly. Um, officers are filmed regularly when dealing with incidents. Um, that is something that they, um, they deal with in the course of their duties. And of course, sometimes, uh, and sadly, we, we need to call on that evidence because uh, the incident may be of such significance or, or so serious that the evidence of, is, of, is of use uh, in us uh, pursuing or prosecuting uh, the case. Um, and that's, that's often sadly been the case in relation to national security issues over, over recent months. Um, so I think um, it's part and parcel of a, of a police officer's life uh, and many other public servants' life that um, members of the public film everything that is going on, including their interactions. Okay, thank you very much indeed. Mm -hmm. There are um, a couple of further issues that um, we, we may need further clarification on, but we will, the committee will write to you because unfortunately we have um, ran out of um, time today. So can I thank all of our witnesses for coming along and for the evidence that they have um, given us. Um, and we will now move into private session. The next subcommittee meeting will be on Thursday the 22nd of June when we will hear from Derek Penman, Her Majesty's Inspector of Constabulary, on his report on the governance of the SPA. And I will suspend briefly to allow our witnesses to leave.